Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for all of your blessings, the way that you work in our lives, the things you teach us. And we're thankful for the fellowship that we can have with one another. We invite your spirit's presence into our hearts that you can unite them together. Help us to understand the things that we study here this evening and guide and direct in the things that we do study. Help us to understand them and that we can share them with others and that they can have an impact in our lives. May your angels watch over each person and uh, we pray uh, for the blessing of, uh, of fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Well, happy Sabbath. It's almost Sabbath here. It'll be Sabbath in like eight minutes, but it's close enough. So as we're continuing this study on the sanctuary, um, it's been trying to pick out just the highlights from the Bible is very, very difficult. So we spent the last couple of Fridays looking at Leviticus 23, dealing with the feasts. And, you know, I read through a bit of Leviticus, looked at some of Exodus. I'm trying to think, okay, what is it that I really need to look at next? Now, you can see here we have the Ten Commandments uh, on, your, on your screen. And in, in trying to understand the sanctuary, of course, we know that the Ten Commandments are part of the sanctuary. So where did the Ten Commandments come from? It's a trick question. Oh, finger of God. <laughs> okay, because you know, many people, if you talk to many people, they would just say, well, the Ten Commandments first show up in Exodus chapter 20. You know, if they know anything about the Bible, they would think, okay, that's that's the Ten Commandments. And, and that's when the Ten Commandments begin. Well, they've, always been, they've always been. Yeah, yeah they're, they always have been. Yeah. Well, they're, they're a transcript of God's character. Now, the, uh, the Hebrew expression for the Decalogue, well, if we take the Greek word Decalogue, what does Decalogue mean? Repeating of the law. No. Oh, Ten no. words. Sorry. Deuteronomy. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Ten words. The Ten words, right? Um, so, that, you know, literally, if you took Decalogue, that's what it means. The Ten words. Deca meaning ten. Logos meaning word. And um, let's, let's just read through. Uh, the Ten Commandments, and see how this is a summary to some degree of what we've already studied so far. Uh, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So this is the first commandment. Now, where do we start the first commandment generally? How do we usually think about the Ten Commandments? Where does where is the first commandment? What word does it start with? Thou shalt. Thou shalt or whatever. Yeah. So, but is the beginning part part of the first commandment? I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of house, out of the house of bondage. Is that part of the first commandment? It is. Mm -hmm. Okay, explain why. It's sort of a, it's referencing that in that aspect. Then from that, it just it seems to be verse three is in that context. It sets the context for verse three. Yeah. And now we know that the Ten Commandments, the way that they're written here, is to the Jews that have been brought out of Egypt. So we know that I wasn't in Egypt personally, never been there. So I haven't been brought out of the land of Egypt. So somebody could say, well, 
you know, this is a law for the Jews, the ones who were brought out of Egypt. Now, also in Deuteronomy, they do have the Ten Commandments repeated, and they're slightly different. Right? So, and we do know that these words, these Ten Commandments, were written on the two tables of stone. And how they were written exactly to what it, it whether there are some things here that that are stated that are, are qualifying statements uh, that weren't actually included what's written on the tablets we have no way of knowing but i personally think that this is what's written on the tablet that it begins with i am the lord thy god now what would be the significance of starting with that Well, not only is it that he's he's the Lord their God, he's the one that used his power to bring them out of Egypt. Yeah, but but it's you know, we often talk about how this the fourth commandment is the one that reveals who is the one of the commandment, who's the one giving the commandments, right? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, right? So it talks about his his title, uh, his territory, and etc. Different things that you have in a seal. So the Sabbath becomes this seal. But in order to look at this 10 commandments, um, these are not really 10 rules telling us what we're supposed to do. And that, that's how we always take them as these are the like 10 laws and, and they are, but these are actually God's promises. This is a covenant that God is making with Israel. And, and we often don't look at the Ten Commandments in the context of his covenant. So God is, is just like he was with Abraham in Genesis 15. He's making a covenant with his people, right? So if we go back to Genesis 15, and because to me, there's tons of significance in Genesis 15. Um, um, he says in verse seven, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So we can see that there is this parallel in, in this covenant that God is making with Abraham or Abram at this time before he's named Abraham um, that parallels the covenant in Exodus chapter 20. And they're called the words of the covenant also. In, in Exodus. So, so God, it's the Lord God, so this is Jehovah, right? The self-existent one, the, uh, the great I am, that is the one who has brought them out of the land of Egypt, just like Abraham was brought, brought out of Ur of the Chaldees. So the fact that it's personalized for the Israelites in this context, when we look at this, is the Ten Commandments a, a reiteration of a covenant that God has already made with mankind? That he made this covenant with Adam, he made this covenant with any that he has, has chosen, right? That he is, he's working with. That he, he makes this covenant with each one of us on some level. Would we agree with that idea? You have in Genesis, I think it's chapter 26, that Abraham is known for keeping God's commandments and statutes. And... Yeah, that's verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we can see that in, in all of these covenants, there has to be um, law, right? That this, this isn't just something that happens in Exodus chapter 20. That this is a, a reiteration of a covenant he's already made. Now, we know there's a thing called the everlasting covenant. What is the everlasting covenant? When's that first mentioned? Genesis 
315? Okay, well, um, well, we have a covenant in, in Genesis 315, but the term everlasting covenant, this is the covenant made with Noah. And, and this is the one with the rainbow, that symbol that's been co-opted by the LBGTQ plus 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 community, right? A bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So this everlasting covenant, who is it between? It's between God and man or Noah. So. And, and also every living creature. And every living creature, yeah. Right. So this is an interesting idea that there's a covenant that God has made between himself and his creation. Now, in Genesis 17, verse 7, we also see again, um, I will establish my covenant between thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So one of the things that we can see is that these covenants that God is making, when it says it's everlasting, this is in reference to the fact that there is this promised seed. So Stephen's right. If we go back to Genesis chapter three, and we look at, at this promise, the gospel promise, um, in verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We can see that this covenant here is, is with this seed, with the descendants. Now, of course, it's also pointing to Christ. Right, so because Christ is the promised seed. And, and so we've, we've dealt with this. We've looked at this. We've uh, examined it quite a bit as we've gone through this study of the sanctuary. So when we go back to Exodus chapter 20, and, you know, there's lots of stuff I could have studied going up to here, um, because we know that this is this whole thing that happens on Mount Sinai, right? So you're going to have Israel on Mount Sinai. Um, in the third month, when the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. And Stephen has done a study on this of where he thinks this is in the third month. Um, and, uh, and you say, which date is it, Stephen? Exodus 9, which date on the biblical calendar? Well, this here date in verse 1, I think it's the 15th day of the right. third month, being yeah. the same day. Yeah, you seem to have made some, yeah, so you seem to have made some good arguments for it, which is a different position than the one that I took originally. And I'm not still not decided on it. Um, I think yours is just as valid as my argument. I don't think um, I can say for certain which one's correct. But, but, but if it's the same day, that just means the same day that they came into the wilderness of Sinai um, is the same day that they went out of the land of Egypt. So the land of Egypt, they left on the 15th day of the first month. So the same day would refer to the 15th day of the third month because they left on the 15th day of the first month right? Mm -hmm. That's the argument you're making, right? And so uh, there's going to be the scene here. Um, there's going to be three days. Yeah, there's going to be three days, right? So he is, has to be ready in verse 11 to be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So which day do you put that as? I think it's the 18th. So you're going to put it as the 18th because mm -hmm. so why wouldn't you put it says sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day if today you're saying today is the 16th in that context. No, um, well, yeah, because they are, I think they arrive in the evening or quite oh, the late on, yeah. on the 15th so it is they're just sort of just there in time to set up their tents and then the sun goes down, basically. Yeah. And then Moses goes up the Moses mountain. Moses went up unto God on the 16th. 
on the 16th. Yes, and so he says today, tomorrow, yeah. and then third day. Okay, now what's what's the significance here of the third day? Because we've talked about this third day quite a bit. But in the context here, what's the significance? What symbol is being presented here by this third day? What's it connected? Well, we could maybe connect it to the three angels' messages. Okay, well, we could do that. But that would be kind of a, a, a looser connection. There's something more solid here. I mean... Three days of Christ. We have the three days of Christ. We have the three days in Ezra. And in, in the three days of Ezra, again, they're going to be called to Jerusalem in that case. Not this isn't called to Jerusalem, but they're going to be called together. Uh, and in that case, they're going to be dealing with um, the renewal of the covenant to God by separating from the strange wives. Right. They're going to make a commitment to God. So mm -hmm. can we say that the third day has something to do with the covenant? That God is using this as a symbol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there's something about this third day that I don't think we understand everything about, but we have to take note of it every time we see it. Now, of course, there's gonna, they're going to put this border around this mountain, and they're not wanting anybody to touch it, man or beast. And then there's going to be a trumpet that sounds, and then they shall come up to the mount. Right. So and then uh, they're going to wash their clothes. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings, a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that the people so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. So, um, so they're going to have these bound, uh, bounds around the mount, um, all these different things that are happening. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just kind of skimming through this here. And so Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And then you're going to have this. And the God spake all these words, saying, so... People are going to hear God speaking. So Moses is basically preparing these people to listen to God speaking. Correct? Yes. So this is what God says to them. I'm the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, why is this the first commandment? I know I'm asking a lot of you. Seems like the seems like all the first four fall into that category. Right. So they're actually going to expand upon. So this is uh, this is a repeat and enlarge if you really want to look at it. Right. Um, and and I don't see many people presenting the first four as a repeat and enlarge, and the last six also as a repeat and enlarge. But but I take this as a repeat and enlarge. Now, we know that the Catholics, when they look at these commandments, they're going to put the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment is going to be thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Right? Nice. That is all the things that we call the second commandment. They just say that's the first commandment. And they're going to divide the 10th commandment into two. Right. So they're, so they're going to get rid of this part that deals with making a graven image. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So this is the second commandment. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water on, under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So, so is this a repeat and enlarge of the first commandment? It seems to me that this is all about relationship. With God? Yes. Okay. Now, so, and, and, and you can see why some people, they could take all of these and they could say, well, I got, if you're going to define the Ten Commandments by thou shalt, you're going to have thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them or serve them. And they could say, well, that's three different commandments. If they really wanted to, to sort of throw a spanner in the works there, they want to confuse people. But we can see that, that these, there is the first four commandments. We have the first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But the, the second one is similar to the first one. We can agree with that, can we not? Yes. Yeah, I'm not saying that the Catholics are correct, but what they're not recognizing is that it is an expansion of the first one, but so is the third one, and so is the fourth one. That is, in each of these, this is an expansion. We could actually say uh, all of these, the first four, all address worship. Correct. Okay. They, they all address worship. And, um, but they're building on each other. Now, in, in the fourth and fifth, it says, thou should not make unto thee any graven image, right? So you're not going to make this graven image. The Catholics, of course, make graven images or likenesses of things that are in the heaven above or the earth beneath or water under the earth. Now, um, uh, Russian Orthodox um, Catholics or Greek, Orthodox. Greek Orthodox or Ukrainian Greek Orthodox or all these different names that you get for the Eastern churches. They don't make graven images, but do they make likenesses? They have icons. They have icons. Yeah. So, so yeah. they have pictures. Uh, you know, I found it interesting reading um, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. They're both Christian Russian writers. Um, and, uh, you know, they talk a lot about the life in Russia. And, and, and you can see that, that uh, Russians had this despising of the idols of the catholics of the roman catholics and yet they have these icons so it's not really very much different as far as i can see whether you have you're praying to a picture on your wall or whether you're praying praying to a statue uh, in 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 your home or outside or whatever in the alcoves they have um they would still pretty much be a contradiction of this a uh, 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 this commandment so you would be breaking this commandment by doing so now now it's, it also adds you're not supposed to bow down thyself to them or serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments now there's a bunch of things in here um, so when we're not going to have other gods before us, so that's the first commandment. The second one, what is, what's being added or what's, what's the distinction of why we would call this the second commandment rather than just an expansion of the first commandment? Why would, what we, what argument could we bring against the Catholics who say, this is all just the first commandment? It has to do with the graven images, as I see it. Okay, so we have the graven images, right? 
So the first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, a Catholic could argue, well, that, that would include any other kind of idol or anything. And, and so verse four and five are just expanding this idea of what these other gods are. They argue that they're not worshipping the idols. They just say they're just like a, just to help them focus on God or yeah. something. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, yeah. And they would say these are false idols, false gods and all that kind of stuff. They, I, I mean, so they would just say we're not doing, we're not transgressing this commandment. But I'm just talking about the idea that these, those three verses, four, five, and six, are actually in, in the Catholic teaching part of the first commandment. It's just an expansion of the first commandment. They don't make it the second commandment. The second commandment is going to be, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So, but of course, that's just an expansion of the first commandment as well. So, so they have a hard time, I think, to try to include that. But what arguments, there are some arguments that we could use to say that these are, are a separate commandment from verse 3, verse 2 and 3 being the first commandment. Because I can see their argument on the, on the one hand, if you look at it superficially, I think it depends upon what you decide is your God. Is your God, you know, another person, another thing, or what is it? Okay. So, I mean, it is telling us what it means to have other gods before God, right? And we should not have other gods before him. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's going to expand upon that. So we can see that these are expanding upon the first commandment. But why would we say it's a, the second commandment? Why wouldn't we use the argument of the Catholics that from verse basically two to six is all the first commandment? I mean, we've made some arguments. Ones we say it's talking about graven image, but they can just say, well, this is just an expansion of the first commandment. So it's all part of it. We have to, we say it's the second commandment. And, and what's our basis for doing that? We can't just say because it says thou shalt not, because verse four and five both start with thou shalt not. And so if we made that argument, we would have to say verse four is the second commandment, verse five is the third commandment, right? I, I, maybe people haven't thought about this that much. But. Were you talking about the issue of whether or not they're making an image that might represent God or look like God? Okay, but there's something more here that makes it the second commandment. Okay, here's another thing that we have to look at. Um, when he says, thou shalt not, or thou shalt have no other gods before me, what is that kind of language? We kind of lose it in our modern English. Is it thou thou should not or thou uh, or do not? Is, does it say do not have other gods before me or do not make unto thee any graven image? What, what is this, this verb thou shalt shalt? So like you will not. It's kind of like you will not, right? Um, so it's so what is it he doing then? What is God saying to the Israelites here when he uses this language? If you love me, you will not do these things. No, that's close nice. Is, isn't this a promise well god brought yes. them out of the land of egypt and he's saying now here's what's going to happen you're not going to have any other gods 
You're not going to bow down to graven images, right? Mm. So God is making a promise of what he's going to do in them, right? Because this is a covenant that God is making or trying to make with Israel. And, and they're going to fail in this covenant because they're going to promise that all the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And, and that seems like a good thing, right? We think, okay. You know, God says, don't do this stuff. And now you say, okay, we won't. But do they have the ability to keep these words that God is expressing to them in and of themselves? No, it's like uh, Peter saying, saying to Christ, yeah, um, you know, I'll never forsake you. Yeah. He doesn't really realize his. Um, weakness yeah and, and and this is an important point because we're going to see as we start to look into the sanctuary because we're going to get there we're going to get to the actual sanctuary to the offerings and so forth that the heart of this is these ten commandments and and if we just take the ten commandments out of the sanctuary the sanctuary loses its meaning And the sanctuary is based upon these promises of, of what God wants to do in humanity. And this goes all the way back to creation. He's reiterating things from creation. That, and we're going to see that when he talks about the heaven above and the earth beneath or the water under the earth, uh, about these graven images. Why is he talking about this? What is he referencing? These would be the images that they would have witnessed in Egypt. Okay, right. So in oh. Egypt, there's all these false gods. And, and these false gods are things they see in the sky. They see on land. And they see underwater. Right? If we look at the pagan gods, whether they're the gods of Egypt or the gods around them, these are nature gods. But God is the one who created them. Now, a person could make a distinction if they wanted to. I don't necessarily make that distinction. That verse 5 is really where um, there's a change. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So it says first, you're not going to make these images. But you're not going to bow down thyself to them or, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What is this, verse 5 and 6, in the context of a covenant? What is God doing here? Can we tie this back to Genesis 15? The two different seeds. Okay. The seed of the woman. Okay, so we got the two different seeds. So we have the distinction of two groups, right? So God is making this promise of what he's going to do in us. But he's also showing that there are going to be a group of people that are not going to be benefited by this. And so the two groups, you have... Uh, and God's going to visit the iniquity, that's the rebellion, of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Why the third and fourth generation? Okay, why the fourth generation? 
you know, the last generation. Any ideas on this? Because remember in Genesis 15, he says they're going to come out in the fourth generation. So is this a reference back to Genesis 15? You can't connect it to that. Okay. Now why the third and fourth? Why not the, the second? I think um, God generally will let things be fulfilled or be more seen, more visible, you know, like Satan when he transgressed. He didn't just kill him straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, he let um, the consequence of his actions and words play out. Yeah. Until the other angels could uh, be more clearly see the where the tending mm -hmm. results of that. Yeah. Now there's another another problem here: visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation so there's there's something else here so are the children responsible for the iniquity of the fathers no okay they're, they're not right now of course there's a consequence that happens from the iniquity of the fathers that exercises or influences the children Onto the third and fourth generation. Now, can Hebrew help us? What does the Hebrew have to say? Like in looking at these. Um, well, it's it's pretty literally translated here. I mean, I mean, we see it doesn't say generation, for instance. In in it says unto the third and fourth of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. Some people actually put generation after the words thousands. Showing mercy unto thousands of generations of them that love me. Um, but whether, however you do it, one of the things is you can see that there's a third and a fourth. That that's sort of the limit of God's punishment. That is, the children are going to receive punishment unto the third and fourth generation for the iniquity of the fathers. But God, but mercy is going to be shown unto thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. Right. So, so there's this contrast. Now, another point dealing with um, the progressive Leviticus uh, 26. So when we deal with the first seven times, second seven times, third seven times, and fourth seven times. Is there the iniquity of the fathers being brought upon to the children in the first generation? That would be Manasseh's captivity. Does anything really bad happen with the first seven times? Manasseh's taken captive. Are the children of Israel, you know, destroyed or scattered or, I mean, obviously northern Israel has been already, but can we see that there's this progression? And even in the second one, which is Daniel's captivity, there's not a great deal of people being taken captive. I mean, they're, they're under this protection racket of, of Nebuchadnezzar now instead of a protection racket where they're under Egypt prior to that. And, and they have to obviously give some treasures and stuff to um, Nebuchadnezzar from the temple. 
but nothing really bad happens until the third generation and particularly the fourth, right? So there's this progression. So the question is, why is this? Why, I mean, we, we've kind of answered it a little bit. But why is God allowing this progression before he visits the iniquity? So we have an opportunity to return to him. Yeah, and that's where I would say the showing mercy unto thousands isn't talking about generations. It's talking about the people who are still following God. So even though there's the iniquity of the fathers that lead to sins that occur, he's going to allow those to bear fruit because he has mercy unto those that do love him and keep his commandments. So if we look at this second commandment, if we're going to encapsulate what this second commandment is about, what, what is it about? that isn't in the, in verse three, that distinguishes this as the second commandment, the second promise, the second word, if we want to put it that way. So the first promise is you're not going to have other gods before me. What's the second promise? That they won't make a, a graven image. Okay. Well, that's in there in, in verse four. But if we look at verse four, five, and six. That I mean, they're, is, they're going to worship God alone. They're going to worship God alone. But it's also addressing the the, the results of false worship compared to true worship. And showing God's covenant, he's actually stating more clearly, his covenant is a covenant of mercy and justice. Can we see that in verse 4, 5, and 6? Yes. Okay. So, so to just to say that this is part of the first commandment as the Catholics do, I don't think is justified because he's actually, he's expanding on it. There's no doubt because this is, is repeat and enlarge all of these commandments, but this one specifically is showing how he's, what, what his purpose of this covenant is. It's a covenant that's going to create two classes of worshipers. That's why when Stephen refers back to Genesis 3.15, and you see the two classes, you can see the two classes are manifest. And this is God's mercy operating, but also his justice. He delays punishment. He doesn't necessarily punish immediately. And that's because he's merciful, but he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on, onto the, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. So there still is going to be a consequences, but those consequences happen to our children often because of our own sins. Now, the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. How is this expansion of the first two commandments? And we know here that name is character. It's not really talking about, you know, I mean, it is partly dealing with a, a false curse, but like a promise, right? A, a false oath. Because taking his name in vain would be making an oath and not keeping it. But, but it's more than that. Because this, to take God's name, if we put it into our sort of colloquial expression, that's when a woman takes somebody's name, they, they get married to them, right? So we're representing God's character. And, and we can't do that in vain. So how is this an expansion of what's happened in the first two commandments? 
well, the first two commandments have to do with how you're going to worship to God. Yeah. And, and if you falter on that, let's say, for example, if you're worshiping on a Saturday and then all of a sudden you start worshiping on a Sunday, that's taking the Lord's name in, in vain, right? So you're not doing what he said. Yeah. Or even just saying that you're a Christian, but not acting as a Christian. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Because if you're taking his name, you're going to take his character. And, and in vain, it's referring to, because, I mean, they translated it into English, and vain means it, it's not a word we use very often, but what would it mean to do something in vain? You're doing something and it's, it's just not, nothing is going to get accomplished by what you're doing. So. Okay. Yeah, so that's how we think of it. It's like, it, it's, it's, it's a failure. Right. But the Hebrew word here, shav, um, in the sense of desolating or evil, literally ruin or morally, especially guile, figuratively idolatry as false, subjectively uselessness. So that's where we get the idea of, of vain as deceptive, objectively, also adverbally in vain, false lie, lying, vain, vanity. So. If we're going to take this, it would just mean that you're not going to be taking God's name in reality. So you can take God's name, but if it's just a pretense or a show, it's vain, it's vanity, it's useless, it's meaningless. It, it is actually witnesses to the fact that you haven't taken God's name in reality. Yeah, and God can read our hearts, so we, we can't we can't fool God in that matter. You might be able to fool others, but you know, right? And and God will not hold him guiltless. That word guiltless here, uh, naka. Um, he won't he won't clear him, right? So this is almost like a legal sort of term. He won't declare him as innocent that taketh his name in vain. So all of this is about the promises that God's going to do in humanity. And, and yet, if we take God's, if we take his name upon us, that means we're going into covenant with him, this marriage covenant with God. We're taking his name, his character, his promises. But if we do this in a way that's just a pretense, then God's not going to be able to declare us as innocent. And, and, and this is really a reference to the sanctuary itself, the whole sanctuary service of what God wants to do. Because the whole purpose is that God's going to write his laws in our hearts and in our minds. He's going to be our God. And, and we're going to act out his character. That's the purpose of the gospel. That's the purpose of the sanctuary, what it points to. So we can see that this is really just an expansion of the first two commandments. So again, it's a line upon line. It's not, it's not like these are four, the first four commandments are four completely separate things. They're all part of one thing that has to do with our love to God. And it's expressed in four different ways or an expansion of those four different ways of what God wants to do in humanity. Now, the fourth commandment doesn't have thou shalt not, just as the fifth commandment doesn't have thou shalt not. It, it's, it's a different sort of language. One is remember, the other one's going to be honor. So, when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shalt thou labor and do all of thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rest the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this commandment, the fourth commandment that we as Seventh-day Adventists obviously believe in, how is it an expansion of the first three? How is it a repeat and enlarge? Okay. 
Can we see that all of these are addressing worship? Yes. Yes, okay. agreed. Yeah. And then we can see that the seventh day is something that God set apart at the beginning. So he's going back to creation and he's saying that I gave this seventh day that you have to remember it and you have to keep it holy, which means to set it apart. Right. So it's that word holy, which is often translated also as sanctified. God sanctified the seventh day. It's the, it's the same kind of, of, of word. In this case, uh, the Hebrew here for holy is just simply uh, the word kadash, which is also related to kodesh. And it means to be clean, um, consecrated, which is to set something apart, or hallowed. Again, this is all about something that's set aside, sanctified, purified, that's separate from sin. So it's clean ceremonially or morally right so we have to keep the sabbath holy but how how does that really relate to what's happened in the first three commandments thou shalt have no other gods thou shalt not make a graven image god is going to visit the iniquity but he's also going to be merciful and you're not going to take the name of the lord god in vain that's the foundation of where it starts okay the foundation of where it starts or the center, mm -hmm. right? So can anybody expand upon that? It, and speak louder. It's <laughs> the, um, the root relationship from, wh from where it, it's founded in, and the principles that it stands on. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's the center of this covenant is this relationship and time with God. That's what I meant. Because if we're going to have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, you're not going to make graven images. God's going to be merciful, but he's also not going to um, not punish because there's punishment attached. He's going to visit iniquity. And we need to take the name of the Lord God in a serious way. We can't take his name in, in, in vanity, in meaninglessness. It has to be in reality, not in just word. But then he's going to go right to the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, we can look at the Sabbath as this prohibition about work. But is that what the Sabbath is about? Is it just about not doing work? No. Okay. <laughs> it's about not doing our own things and our own pleasures. But okay. Turning to well, that, God. Okay, turning to God. So so God says we're not going to do any work. We're going to remember the Sabbath day and we're going to set it apart for this holy use. Now six days we have to labor and do all of our work. Right? But he's given us this special day in which we're going to have fellowship with him. That is, we're going to set aside the cares, the worries. Um, and we're going to remember that God is the one who created all things. So when, when we think about this in Ezekiel chapter 20, what does it say about the Sabbath and also Exodus 31, 13? What is the purpose of the Sabbath? It's a sign. A sign, yeah. Of the relationship we have with him. Yes. He says in 31 13, speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So the Sabbath is given for God's sanctifying of us. The Sabbath is sanctified, and we have to remember and keep it. But it, the purpose is so that we may know that God can sanctify us. So is the Sabbath just about the Sabbath? Not at all. Yeah. So if we go on and read this here, 
It says, ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, because, because God is the one that sanctifies us. This is the reason we keep the Sabbath, for it is holy, it's sanctified, it's set apart unto you. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Now, we can take this as, as it is literally in the sense that the commandment is, if somebody transgresses the Sabbath, they're going to be put to death, they're going to be stoned. But, but also it is true that somebody who defiles the Sabbath will in the end be put to death. And why is that? Why is the Sabbath so important? Why is it the final test? Because God set it apart at the beginning of creation. Okay, but that's true. But it's going to be the final test. Now, there's lots of reasons that we know as Seventh-day Adventists. It, it, it has the seal in it of God's character. He's the one who's created everything and so forth. It shows his territory, his, his name, his um, title, all those things that you would have in a seal of a king. But could God have somebody that has not been sanctified? Could they live in God's presence for eternity? Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so the Sabbath is given so that it can do something to us that because it's about fellowship with God. And as you go through these promises in the Ten Commandments, in the first four, it's working its way towards the purpose. And that purpose is the sanctification, the restoration of the image of God in humanity. And that's what the Sabbath is about. Now, we know that many Seventh-day Adventists look at the Sabbath in sort of a, a legalistic way, especially, I would say, liberal Adventists, even more than conservative Adventists, in that somehow the fact that we just keep the Sabbath, that's going to save us. That is, uh, we lower the standard to some minimum of some sort of uh, obedience, and that's going to save us. You know, it has to be some sort of thing that we can keep, though, of course, right? So we have to lower the Sabbath down to uh, mm -hmm. a standard that we can keep so that we can then see ourselves as righteous. But the Sabbath is something that actually reveals to us our sinfulness. It cuts against human nature. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. They were legalistic and they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Right. Uh, so we need, we need that. That's first, first hand. Yeah. And then with that, then, then we're able to keep the law. So. Yes. But it's Christ's righteousness. Christ keeps the law through us because he's the one that sanctifies us. Correct. So, yeah. so the Sabbath is going to show us that we're a sinner and that we're far from God. Much more than the other commandments, if, it's, if we really are honest with ourselves. And its purpose is sanctifying that is, when we spend time with God and we're fellowshipping and we're studying, we're fellowshipping with God's people and we're studying God's word. But we also know that the Sabbath is not just about one day in the week because you have to work for six days and then you rest the Sabbath day. Can a man enter into rest if he hasn't worked? No. Okay. Explain. <laughs> well... What are you resting from if you haven't worked for six days? Yeah, if you're resting like you're seven days a week. You're really running from something and you're not going to get anywhere. It's yeah. just a vicious cycle. If you, re if you try resting seven days a week, you, you become restless. Exactly. It's right? counterproductive. If you work hard for six days, you're going to experience rest on the seventh day. And you're going to need it. Yeah. But this is talking spiritually, of course. The whole purpose of this is this is an illustration. Because remember, he says it's a sign. What is a sign? Is a sign a symbol?
I'd say yes. Yeah. So, so the Sabbath is given as a sign or a symbol. It's figurative. God isn't saying that somebody who just doesn't work six days and takes the seventh day off from work has somehow kept the Sabbath. That's not really Sabbath keeping because he has to also be sanctified. And only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. And when we look at this rest that's talked about in the Sabbath, because this I've been doing in the Hebrew studies on uh, every second week on, on Sabbath afternoon, um, looking at what Paul talks about with this um, in chapter four and so so forth, is that we could see that that the that there remaineth the keeping of Sabbath to the people of God for he that is entered into his into God's rest must cease from his own work as God did from his. So let's let's look at that verse. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting when you think about it that Paul, in his book to the Hebrews, where he's going to deal with the sanctuary, um, he's going to get to the Sabbath um, as as sort of the center of what he's talking about. For he that is entered into his rest. He also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So we, we work six days and we rest. We rest from our own works. But it says we have to enter labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. That means in order to go into God's rest, what, what, what was God's work at creation? What kind of work was it? What did he say? All that the Lord had created, what did he say about it? He saw it was it was all good. Very good, right? Very good. Okay. So then God rested the seventh day from all the works that he had made. So if I'm going to enter into God's rest, what kind of labor must I have? Good labor. Yeah, very good. It has to be perfect. So the only way that I can enter into God's rest is to be perfect. Now, that I can't do in and of myself. I need a savior. And the sanctuary is pointing to that. But isn't that also why we seek him out daily? We're supposed to mm -hmm. study daily. So then when it comes to the Sabbath, then we can commune with him on his level and he can talk yeah. with us. Yeah. So if we're going about our six days of labor, not even thinking about God, um, you know, caught up in the world. And then we just think a seventh day Adventist, oh, Sabbath's coming, we get ready, sunset, you know, we got our shoes polished, we got our clothes already pressed, we got our Sabbath meal already, you know, we sit around and we pray and bring in the Sabbath, we have, you know, Vespers or something. And, and yet, our mind is going to be where on the Sabbath? On the things that we did all week. It's going to be on, on the way that we thought all week. So even if we could, we could somehow manage to keep the sabbath in a sort of literal sense set aside all of our work you know make sure our kids aren't playing outside and playing on the swings and stuff like that um and uh you know whatever you know kids do and and we just sit at home and dad reads from the bible or the spirit of prophecy and and there's many adventists who keep the sabbath that way and haven't experienced because they're not there every day having this fellowship with God. When they get to the Sabbath, the fellowship with God thing doesn't really happen. It, well, it's, it's something that people are just doing out of fear. It also becomes a burden, which the Sabbath is, was right. never intended for. And, and then, of course, what happens over time is people, their Sabbath keeping becomes lax. So Adventists used to keep the Sabbath very strictly. Doesn't mean they were converted. It just means... They believe they have to keep the Sabbath strictly. Adventists don't keep the Sabbath very strictly anymore. So, so that even that picture that I described hardly exists in many Adventist homes. But it does in some homes, but it doesn't mean that those people are really keeping the Sabbath. Because if they're not perfect, in, if they're not reflecting, reflecting Christ's character in their everyday life, if their thoughts aren't daily, moment by moment, connected with Christ, 
just keeping the Sabbath isn't really going to happen. They're not going to enter into that rest. So to me, this is um, a really important part of understanding the sanctuary, why it was given to Adventists, and, um, and why we were given the Sabbath as well. Because the Sabbath and the sanctuary go together. Um, Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, so we dealt with the, the first four commandments. I mean, there's probably more I could deal with in some of these things. We obviously, but there are things that we've already studied many times. We know that this is a commemoration of God's creative power that's also uh, reflected in his recreative power to restore humanity to the image of Christ, to the purpose that God has created man for. But uh, I'm not going to go into that too much. What I want to do is look at these last six commandments. So honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, we know that the last six commandments have to do with our fellowship or our, our love towards man, our relationship to man. The first four are our relationship to God. Now, sometimes people will take these last six commandments and say, well, that's the basis of our legal system. You know, you shouldn't murder people. Um, not sure about how committing adultery relates to much of what we see nowadays in the legal system. But, you know, you shouldn't steal things. Bearing false witness, of course, is perjury um, in a court setting, is what that's talking about. And then, of course, it's going to talk about coveting things, which, which of course, has to do with what goes on in your, your mind, your heart. Um, so you couldn't really make a law against coveting, right? You couldn't have, you know, laws on the books about coveting uh, because the government can, couldn't know whether you're coveting something or not. They can tell whether you're stealing something, whether you're lying, whether you're, you're killing or committing adultery, uh, but they can't really tell whether you're coveting or not. So we can see that these commandments are not dealing really with external actions as much as with what goes on in the heart. And so that these aren't really civil laws as such. Some people try to, to, to say that the last six commandments are civil laws. A.T. Jones makes really good arguments to show that the government can't know what goes on in your heart and, and that the Ten Commandments are about what goes on in your heart. So, so the, even though there's some relationship to the big basis of what we would call civil law, um, they're not the same thing. The Ten Commandments are not civil law. These are religious laws. Mm -hmm. and, and they actually have, we know that if you, you know, hate your brother, it's the same as murdering him, Jesus says. So the government can only deal with the fact if you killed somebody. They can't deal with the fact that you don't like somebody or you, I mean, they might be able to say, you know, if you did some slander, that would maybe be false witness again um, about somebody. But, if, you know, if you don't do any actions, uh, the government can't deal with what's going on in your heart. But thou shalt not kill does. It addresses what goes on inside in your character. So the government can't judge your character in that sense. So the next question then, why is it honoring thy father and thy mother that comes next? Now, I know I ask these types of questions as if we know what goes on in God's mind. Um, and maybe we're guessing a little bit. But why is this command? What is it particular about this commandment? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Well, the, the mother and father are, in a sense, as a child, representatives of God. And as you obey them, you obey God. Okay. 
So God has given us mother and father as authority figures in our life. Now, you're going to have to forgive me here. I'm not saying that God is two genders, but the father represents what aspect of God? Justice. And the mother? Mercy. Right. So, so we can see that God's given us a mother and a father to represent these two aspects. And, and nowadays, of course, people wouldn't, would totally deny that whole idea. But I, I think it's built into our nature generally. Women are much more likely to be mothers than, than men are. Because women, if they're going to get a job, what kind of jobs would they more likely gravitate towards? Child minding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, things where they're taking like nurses, uh, things. Men generally don't like to be nurses. Uh, they like to be engineers. Do very few women want to be engineers. Um, there's always some, you know, and there's always some fathers who are very loving and gentle and kind. Um, and they're very motherly in that sense. But, but that's not the norm that lies outside the norm. We know that generally men are much more um, are much more likely, like if a child gets into trouble, uh, to hold that child accountable than a mother would be in, in a healthy home. Right? Correct. Yeah. So, so then in answering that question, that the father and mother represent God, why is this then the next commandment? It, because remember the first four are love towards God and the next ones are love towards our fellow men. What's the purpose of this commandment or this promise? Because this one has a promise to it as well. I think it links the worship of God to the love to man. Okay, so it links the love of God to the love of man. And, and ideally, if we think about a home, having a father and mother, they're supposed to be teaching us how to love God so that we can love the people around us. The purpose of a family, which hardly exists anymore, is to be a home of love and instruction so that we can learn to to love those around us, not just our family, but those that are outside of our family. And when it comes to the influences that we have in our lives, your parents are the biggest influence on who you become as an adult. We're a lot like our parents, whether we like to admit it or not. And if we don't honor our father and mother, how are we going to honor God? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the honor your father and mother thing sometimes create a, creates problems for some people because their parents are not godly. And it's, it's hard to know what we mean by that. Now, an example that I used to always get in trouble with from whatever I used to get in trouble for was, you know, my dad was a minister. And, and he was pretty wacky. So he, um, he believed a lot of weird things, like the Reader's Digest is more inspired than the Bible. But my dad also had some problems in that he had Asperger's. Um, he was very odd in his thinking and in his social interactions. And he did later in life, uh, me, him and I became reconciled. But I was always at odds with my father. And and my dad was not happy. It was as if I was not honoring him. One of the things that he thought I needed to do to honor him was to be a member of the United Church of Canada. Um, for me to become a Seventh-day Adventist was dishonoring him. But the question is, was I honoring my father? Now, maybe I shouldn't have said some of the things I said about him in public, you know, the things that he believed. But was I actually honoring him, maybe, 
in making the choices that I did. And if I was honoring, how, how was I honoring him? Because I didn't hate my father by any stretch of the imagination. I had no bitterness or resentment towards him. I just had compassion. So how was I honoring my father when I became baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist on December 25th, 1982? How was that honoring my father when he was pretty upset about it? Well, by, sh by showing him the, the, the true path. Actually, I was, and I was following the principles that he had actually taught me and shown me uh, in his character. My dad was not a bad character. He was pretty mixed up intellectually. Uh, but my parents were extremely loving towards people around them. Um, they would be the example of what you would call charity and not the type of charity where they're just giving money, but they're giving their time and their energies to help people, visiting the sick the, you know, the, the orphans and the widows. Um, anybody was welcome in our home at any time. And even if we weren't there, but mostly we were there in inviting people in. So we had lots of people living with us. Kelly Roth lived with our family, never paid rent or anything. He got kicked out of his home when he was 16, moved in with our family. So my parents, and my parents never expected anything of anybody they were helping. Um, they just tried to live an example. So I tried to live by the principles that my father and my mother taught me. So I was honoring my father and mother when I chose to follow God completely. In spite of the fact that it contradicted the way that they were following God in some aspects. So this always becomes a problem for some people, especially not so much here in North America, but in other countries. Some people have a really hard time with this commandment when they want to honor their father and mother and their father and mother says, no, you can't become a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, what about the promise attached to it, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth you? Because... Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 3, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with, the, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So he puts on the earth instead of the land, but it's the same word, really. The land here, Eretz, which means land or earth. Anyway, um, what is this promise that's attached to this? This this is expansion of what some of you have said before. So this is about how it transcends or transitions from how we love God to how we love each other. And the father and mother are put in that place. So what benefit do we have in obeying our father and mother or honoring them according to this? And how would we interpret that in the present sense? I think you can see an aspect of health connected to it. Okay. You're, you're well, health. To live. Yeah. Yes. So you're going to have health. Now, I would say... Part of the thing, because we live in a quite a different culture, but if you were honoring your father and mother, uh, one of the things that the family provides is protection. So it's not just even health, it's even protection from your enemies and from maybe getting in trouble. Um, you know, there's probably many people who have died because they haven't listened to their father and mother and they've, they've either, you know, done something foolish, they caused their death, um, you know, immediately or something sinful that's caused their death um, more gradually, like maybe, you know, prostitutes or alcohol or something like that or drugs. Um, so there is a promise here of, of that. But can you expand upon it a little bit more? Because you say the day is going to be long. You're going to be able to live a long time upon the land. 
there's something more there. Because what is the land? Promised land. So it's the promised land, right? So, so God is saying to them, if you honor your father and mother, this land that you're going to be going to, it's not that you just personally are going to live long upon the land, but the nation, nation that's being established is going to live long upon the land. Correct? Yeah, you could have that other application. Yeah. So there's, there's the personal application, but there is also the application of a nation. And if we think about it, the honoring of the father and the mother would actually help establish them upon the land. And, and, and just expand why. why. What's the direct relationship? We know that, of course, they're going to, if their father and mother are honoring God, they're going to be godly. They're not going to be worshiping idols. They're going to be keeping the Sabbath, those types of things. But what else? We've sort of touched on it. Because what is the family about? What is it? It's a mini example of the Godhead. Okay. Which would be kind of government, maybe. So is, it, is the family unit the building block of society? Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So, so in order for them to fulfill their purpose in the land that God is sending them to, they can't be depending upon the government the, the king, the authorities to control and bring about um, civil order. Because why is our world in the condition that it is today? Is it because there's not enough police on the streets? No, it's because of the family. The family the is broken down. Yeah. Yeah. That building block of society is broken down. It, if you had people honoring their father and mother, you would have very little crime. You'd have very little problems with drugs. You would have, you could live in a peaceful society and, and walk down the street without danger. And that's disappearing today. Used to be when I was young. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. It's just my perspective. I mean, I got in some fights and stuff when I was a kid, you know, my brother got beat up a couple of times, but, um, you know, the world was a lot safer place. I mean, I live in a pretty small town, um, but it's not a safe place at night. You know, there's no place safe really hardly at night. It's, even your own farmhouse out in the country may not be safe because there's so much evil in the world. People are seeking to steal, to hurt, to harm you because society is broken down. And, and we put the government somehow to protect us when the family unit is the thing that was to give us protection with, with God as, as the head, really. So all of these other commandments, you will not kill, which is about murder, of course, not talking about killing animals or going to war. You shall not commit adultery. And, and of course, this has a spiritual application as well. You will not steal. And, and of course, we would know that stealing is the result of covetousness. But people aren't going to steal. If you honor your father and mother, you're not going to do any of these things. Your father and mother are ones who for many people, that's the only one that they care about. If they were going to be caught as a criminal, they wouldn't really care what's going to happen to them. It's how I dishonored my father and mother. At least that's the way it should be. So then the, 
the last two, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, I said this is about perjury. But this is also about gossip and things like that. What, what's the center of this commandment? What is this commandment really about? Now, what would we normally say if we're going to put it into modern language for children um, and we wanted to say what Exodus 2016 is? What would we say? You should not lie. You should not lie. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you should not lie. Um, but is it much more than that? Most definitely. Yeah. So how much more of it? What, what, how would we expand this? What is this about? Bearing a false witness is more along the lines of saying things about another person that you know are patently untrue or getting others to believe in something about another person that maybe has a glimmer of truth, but is not wholly true. Okay. So in, in the context here of lying, it's really lying about other people. Right. So what is this sin? Because think about this is about our love towards others. So killing, we can see really that's a sin. Because what are we doing when we're killing? Taking the life of another person. Right. We're stealing a life from another person. We're taking something from someone else. When we're committing adultery, what are we doing? Are we taking something that's not ours? Yes. Okay. What about when we're stealing? Are we taking something that's not ours? Yes. Yes. Okay. So when we bear false witness, are we taking something that's not ours? Yes. We, yeah. Yeah. What are we taking? Another person's reputation. Right. We're destroying their reputation in order to build up our own reputation, correct? Yes. That's why people bear false witness. And that's why they do it in court, to protect themselves from punishment, usually, or to cause damage to another person. But it's always, these are all about stealing, but different things, life, um, somebody's wife, somebody's possessions, somebody's reputation. And you can see then, that these all come from honoring our father and mother or not honoring our father and mother, I guess, if we're not going to do these things, um, you know, if we're going to kill, if we're not going to. Now, now when we think about it, thou shall not kill, this is, of course, is a very sort of negative thing. It's talking about what we're not going to do. But when Jesus uh, summed up these last six commandments, what, how did he describe it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. What was that? It's love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor. Right. Uh, so this love thyself. Right. So this is about love, right? Yeah. And and of course, if we hate our brother, you know, we've we've murdered him in our heart. You know, if we lust after a woman, we've already committed adultery. Now some people would say that the last commandment is almost not necessary. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Um, and I, I really have a hard time how, how the Catholics try to make this two commandments. Because um, it's clearly all about the, when you talk about your neighbor's house, Aren't you talking about his wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's? You're not talking yes. about the neighbor's house, you know, and then now you're also not going to covet these things. Those are all part of that house. It's actually just defining what the house is. 
correct? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now, in, in taking this, because, you know, this is a study on the sanctuary, and we can see that, you know, the first four commandments are about love towards God, which is about fellowship or worship of God. And the center of that is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, of course, is about God sanctifying us. But now we have in these last six commandments, things that on the surface are just, you know, things you could make as law. You, you know, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't, uh, you know, lie in court. But then you got this last one about coveting. And of course, that's something that deals with the heart. That's, that's your thoughts, your mind, your feelings. And it's hard to make a law against that. And, and they generally don't. Um, though they started to do this uh, because, you know, hate speech is kind of that sort of thing where we're, we're trying to read people's minds. So somebody can say something, not, not mean it, you know, that he has hatred towards anyone, but just... That almost anything can be hate speech now. Saying, you know, that committing adultery is a sin can be hate speech. So, uh, so obviously the, the government has overstepped its bounds when it comes to civil laws. But why is this the 10th commandment? Not trusting in God's provision. Uh, okay. Right. Because God has just said he's going he's gonna to put you in this promised land. He's going to give you all of these things he's providing for you. And so this covetousness is actually a rejection of God. It actually ties us back to the first four commandments in, in a very clear way. At least to me, I think it's clear. Because God's going to provide all these things for you. And it's getting to the heart of what he's talking about, about murder, adultery, stealing, and bearing false witness. We, we can't, we have to be changed on a heart level in order for those things to become a reality. So God says, you're not going to covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his servants, his his animals or anything that is your neighbors because i'm going to write my law on your on your heart and in your minds right i'm going to give you a new heart a heart of flesh not a heart of stone right all these different promises that god has about changing our character and and so this this last commandment shows that this is about character not about external actions And so this is something that only God can truly judge. Now, when we look for justice in the world, because this, this is part of this God's covenant with us. Um, when we look for justice in the world, what are we doing? Should we expect justice in the world? No. Maybe an imperfect justice. I mean, well, imperfect justice, definitely. But God has made a covenant with us. And, and, you're, and we don't have time to go into everything in Leviticus where it talks about our relationship with our fellow men. But the one thing that we do see in the scriptures is that um, really true justice in this world never comes about. The justice is a far off. It's going to come in the future. That's what the thousand years is about. That's about the reckoning of the books so that we can see that justice is done. So in understanding that, this is all part of the, the sanctuary. This, this is written on tables of stone that are going to be placed in the ark. So just to finish this off, 
because I know I'm going to have to expand on this next study next Friday. But we see, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood far off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou not, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And then it says, I need to scroll up here. So trying to scroll with the wrong screen. That's it. Um, and Moses said unto the people, fear not for God has come to prove you. So what does that mean? Prove. To test. Yes, yeah, so to test them. And that his fear may be, be before your faces, that ye sin not. So God is dis demonstrating his character in contrast to ours, that we're going to fear him, that we sin not, right? So God is showing his justice here on Mount Sinai. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. So um, now there's a whole bunch of things here that I'm going to skip. And uh, let me see where it is. I can't. Okay, let me see if I can find this. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be in Exodus 24. So the covenant's going to be confirmed. So they have all these things, which I'm not going to read all these different laws. Um, so Moses is going to get build an altar. And then it says, if he took the Buddha, blood of the covenant, so he's going to slay some oxen. Um, he's going to take half the blood, put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkles on the altar. And he took the book, book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Now, just this part. So we're going to leave it here at this, but just a question. Was this what God wanted from the people? All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So we could read it, you know, where it goes back and he says that God is doing this so that you will fear him and that you will not sin. And then we see this people fearing God and making this promise to God. So is this what God was wanting? Is this the response he was wanting to elicit? No. How do we know? Well, I think El might comment on it. Okay. And Paul comments on it. Yeah. Because this promise that the people make, are they able to keep it? No. No. Because no, Moses goes up in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. When he comes back, they've already broken all the laws. So it's pretty clear that God is using this as an example. And, and we're going to look into that. So we're going to look into what happens next week and why it happens. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Just one comment referring to uh, honoring your father and mother. Mm -hmm. We know in the last days, uh, reading in Luke 12, mm -hmm. yeah. verse 253, where the father shall be divided against his son and the son against his father and the mother against his daughter. But that, that has more to do with unbelievers. Uh, well, yeah, I mean. Per per persecuting believers, right? So, yeah. But yeah. yeah, and we also know that people are going to be dishonorable to father and mother without natural affection, all these types of things that have happened in this world. I mean, the family unit has broken down. The world is wicked. 
I mean, it's gotten so bad. Yeah, that that's just so biblical b- biblical evidence of of why you know y- you should honor your father and mother. So yeah. And then there's nothing that, you know, any government's going to do about trying to restore, you know, family values or things like this. Um, it's not going to fix the problem because the, the problem is, is deep rooted in our hearts. People have to be converted. And that's why I don't believe in politics and I believe in the gospel. Mm, amen. I can't, can't save anybody by making a law, but I can save somebody by leading them to Christ. And, and that's a difficult work. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Not everyone's going to be saved. And, but yet we can see that God has given us a means. The message of Adventism is the message of salvation. It is the gospel. The everlasting gospel. This three-step testing prophetic message. The three mm-hmm. angels messages. And we have to experience it. It's not enough to just, you know, put some angels on our churches or to be able to recite, you know, Revelation 14. God is putting us through an experience. This movement has been going through an experience that is meant to change us. And and we're very resistant to change. Mm -hmm. We're very much interested in self-justification. We're not interested in being broken upon that rock. So, so anyway, thanks everyone for the input. We're going to close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all your blessings for the Sabbath, for the fellowship, for waking up Stephen. And uh, we just invite, Lord, your Holy Spirit into our lives each moment that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing. And that it can give us strength for the trials and the week ahead of us. But right now, Lord, we ask that we can rest from all of our labors. That we can set aside our sin and trust in the righteousness of Christ that has been offered to us. Be with us in our studies. And uh, continue to teach and lead us. May your angels watch over us. And may your purposes be fulfilled in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.